In every endeavor, there are always a series of first times. Sometimes they pass so subtly or quickly that we may not even notice them. Other times they make such a strong impression that we can't help but realize that they have changed us in our perceptions. This image of the Rosette Nebula is just such an image for me. As my first narrowband image, it provided the metaphorical slap to the head and made it clear why narrowband imaging was such a potent tool. I'd always intended to do narrowband imaging, but it took about a year longer than anticipated to finally be able to start that journey. That was a little frustrating, but looking for a silver lining, it allowed me to develop my image processing skills to the point where I think I was able to get a better result than I would have back then. This data was acquired over four nights in mid-January, and I ended up with 14.2 hours. It ended up being almost evenly distributed with 56 H-alpha, 56 O3, and 58 S2 frames. Each frame was 300 seconds long and gain 200 was used. Actually, gain 139 was used for the H-alpha frames, but I was concerned that my levels were a bit too low, so switched to gain 200 for the oxygen and sulfur frames. I live under a sky that is nearly Bortle 7, according to the sky maps. The Good to Stargaze app says it's Bortle 6.9. I wanted to make my narrowband imaging as effective as possible, so I opted for 3 nanometer narrowband filters from Astrodon. My budget was not happy with that, but I figured that under this light pollution that is only going to get worse over time, it would be a good investment. When the first H-alpha subs came in, I was amazed. The contrast and detail were incredible compared to a broadband image. If there was even a gradient, it was too subtle for me to see visually. I knew the H-alpha signal was going to be much stronger than the oxygen or sulfur, but I was excited. The only question is whether the background sky was going to have enough signal to bury the read noise. I was very close to the minimum recommended value, so much so that I ultimately decided to go with gain 200, which got me closer to five times the read noise squared. O3 wasn't a problem. More light pollution exists at that wavelength, but hydrogen and especially sulfur were pushing the limits. That pushed me toward raising the gain. Here are the three integrated masters. We have hydrogen here at the bottom, oxygen on the top right, and sulfur on the top left. You can see hydrogen and oxygen have basically the same shape, while the sulfur is a bit more amorphous. If we look in at some of the details here, we can see that there was a lot of detail captured. Even in the sulfur, which was the weakest signal, we still have a fair amount of detail, including some intriguing knots and filament-like things here. The Bach globules don't stand out as clearly. I'm assuming that's because the sulfur signal is so much weaker, and so we don't quite get the contrast with the darker globules like we do in the others. Now that we have the three integrated masters, I ran the same three processes on all of them. I ran uh, DBE, I actually started with Mure Denoise, then DBE, and then finally ran linear fit on the oxygen and sulfur using the hydrogen as a reference. If we take a quick look here, I used manual DBE points and placed them here. Um, it's possible that I actually did sacrifice a little bit of, of nebulosity out here in the edges because if you push this data hard, it actually goes pretty much all the way out to the edge. But I wanted to make sure there were no gradients and I was willing to sacrifice a little bit of the faintest nebulosity to get a, a nice flat background. And that seemed to work out pretty well. Now it was time to combine the data. I decided I didn't want to do a Hubble palette image, although the data looked great presented that way. Part of my motivation was a recent image by a club member who had just finished 40-hour Rosette integration and presented it in the Hubble palette. It was fantastic. So I decided I wanted to approach it differently. For reasons that I don't really understand, the Rosette reminds me of the Eye of Sauron as presented in the Lord of the Rings movies. I don't really know why. The shape isn't the same, but there's an energy in both that seems to tickle the same part of my brain. So I decided to do a custom palette, 
that would end up being somewhat warmer than the Hubble palette and also made the stars a more pleasing color. This is, of course, even less scientifically useful than a conventional image, but this wasn't about science. This was about making an image that I liked. I tried a few different combinations and ultimately settled on the values here. I went with this combination because it made for a warmer palette than the Hubble palette, and that helped emphasize the energy that I was visualizing in my head. The warmer purple for the core seemed more dangerous than the cool blue of the Hubble palette. I wasn't really sure about this smog yellow on the edges, but I was willing to see where this went. The first thing I did was run background neutralization. So let's make a small preview here. And run background neutralization. And if we re-screen stretch, we have a much more neutral background. And I still was, was liking the color balance. The yellow wasn't as objectionable to me as it was before. Next was to stretch. Let's remove our screen stretch. Here is the histogram transformation that I did. And you can see we're zoomed in a hundred times here on the histogram. And we raised the black point slightly, of course, brought the, uh, the midpoint slider in quite a bit. And we're not clipping much, just a tiny amount. And uh, let's go ahead and apply that. And there is our result. I was pretty pleased with this. The background level is up here at about 0.14, almost 0.15. We've got quite a bit of wispiness in the... Uh, the edges, and uh, I, I thought that was something that I could work with pretty well. Overall, I was pretty happy with the way things were going at this point. I wanted to run local histogram equalization next to create contrast within the image. To facilitate that, I produced this range mask. It's possible I could have gotten away without this mask entirely. We are basically affecting almost the entire image. But this was the mask that I created with range mask. And if we apply it there, we can see the mask is really affecting pretty much all of the image except for the edges. This was the first LHE that I applied. It had a kernel radius of 80 and a contrast limit of 1.1. And we're only applying it in a very small amount. Only a third of the LHE is being applied to the image. I, I wanted to keep this subtle. In fact, you'll, you may not even be able to see it in the video when we apply it. The LHG at a kernel radius of 880 works on fairly small structures within the image. And I found that if I used too high a contrast limit or too much of an amount, it made too much of a change. I, it started to make the image look unnatural to my eye. And there you can see the result, maybe. If we zoom in, maybe we'll have a better chance here. If we undo, and then redo, it's, it's very, very subtle. I'm not even sure that YouTube compression will allow that to come in. Let's try here at the larger scale. Yeah, it's very mild. The next one will be much more obvious. This uses a kernel radius of 180 and a contrast limit of 1.5, and half of that is allowed to come through. And when we apply this, this will take longer to run, and uh, so when this finishes, we'll show you the result. And here we have the results of the second LHE. If we back this off, you can see that the image looks much flatter now. And if we redo, you can see that these darker areas, oops, sorry about that. We can see that these darker areas become much more pronounced, but it's still a modest change. It's, it's not overdone, I don't think. So there's with it off 
and there's with it on. And you can see that brings out some of the edges too. So I, I liked the way this worked. Next, I disabled the mask and ran curves. And you can see here, we're just making a very small pull down and the, uh, in the shadow areas of the histogram to uh, just bring the background down a little, bit, a little bit and create a little bit more separation between the nebula and the background. Then I re-enabled the mask. and ran another curve transformation, this time on saturation, to just boost the saturation a, a tiny amount. Let's see. It's a fairly modest saturation increase, but it just helps the nebula pop out a bit. Next I ran the Dark Structure Enhance script. This doesn't always improve the image, but I suspect that it might in an image like this, which had a lot of darker areas. And it's always easy enough to back out if you don't like the results. And it's also very easy to run, so it's, it's generally worth trying. And we can see here that those darker areas, the Bach globules and the, the center core of the the nebula were definitely made a bit more contrasty by that. The last thing that I did was to run the advanced sharpening script, and I find on my images that reducing the layer 2 bias to 0 0.3 keeps the image from being over sharpened. The defaults make it just a little too sharp for my taste. And there's the result of that. I'm not sure you can see the result at that scale, but if we zoom in and back it off and then redo it, undo, redo, you can see that the the Bach globules get just a little bit crisper. And then the last thing that I do before saving a JPEG is to convert from uh, to the sRGB space. It's kind of implicitly in Adobe RGB right now. And so that won't have any visible effect. But there we have it. I'm really pleased with how this came out. If we zoom in, you can see we've got a lot of great detail in the core. The block, the Bach globules look pretty good out here at the edge. It looks pretty good for my first narrowband image. I'm quite happy with how this came out. So I hope this helps other new imagers. If you've only done broadband imaging like I had, it's just mind-blowing how much more data you capture in a single narrowband sub compared to the broadband subs. So I'm looking forward to my next image and actually planning to do the Sol Nebula, but we've had weeks of rain and clouds, so I'm not sure when I'm going to get a chance to finish that. So until next time, clear skies and keep looking up.